Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our seminar on social media hate speech. How does discrimination spread through algorithms? This is a part of the project we jointly conduct with the Swedish Consulate General, the project on identifying hate speech through the AI. We're joined by Susan Benish, the Dangerous Speech Project Founder Director, and our moderator will be Yasemin Inje Olu, who will be uh, talking about how to uh, deal with hate speech in social media, what technologies are behind it, what are the roles played by various actors involved in this, and what responsibilities do they have. I would like to hand the microphone over to Yasemin Inje Olu, our moderator, uh, and I'd like to welcome you all again. Yeah, Semin Hanam, it's over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome uh, all the participants and thank uh, dear Professor Susan Benesh for being uh, with us this evening. Evening time in Turkey, in the United States, I think it's something like afternoon, early afternoon. Uh, I will be moderating our online talk titled Social Media and Hate Speech. Uh, how does uh, discrimination uh, spread through algorithms where we'll, we'll be discussing hate speech on social media? Uh, let me first introduce uh, Susan Benesh, the founding director of uh, Dangerous Speech uh, Project. Uh, to you briefly. Uh, Susan is a faculty uh, associate of the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and uh, Society at uh, Harvard University. And uh, she teaches human rights at uh, the American University School of International Service. And she started out as a journalist uh, covering many subjects, including wars and severe human rights violations in uh, several countries. She also gave a speech in 2015 in a panel discussion uh, on dangerous speech, which was held at uh, Grant Dink Foundation, where I uh, first met her. From then, uh, we know that uh, she prefers uh, to use dangerous speech instead of hate speech. Uh, and I remember her stating that uh, some types of discourse cannot be always covered by the notion of hate speech since the uh, categories, uh, boundaries are uh, hard to define and are often uh, subjective, whereas dangerous speech is a smaller, more uh, clearly bounded category. Now, I will go on uh, by saying a few words in order to uh, frame our online talk. Uh, as you know, discriminating hateful speech online, often uh, targeting uh, specific groups and minorities, uh, has uh, become a big problem in uh, societies. And the production and dissemination of uh, online hate speech uh, have increased uh, since half of the world's population uses social media and the source of reliability of information have become more ambiguous. And uh, hateful speech uh, potentially creates enmities, uh, silences, debates, and marginalizes individuals and uh, groups uh, from participation uh, online. And uh, what is challenging is that hate speech now refers to a variety of speech acts and other ill behaviors taking place online, ranging from penal criminal acts to speech that is uncivil and disturbing and yet tolerated. And this uh, definitional difficulty is further uh, complicated uh, by claims that 
any limitations on hate speech and danger uh, people's right to freedom of expression. And despite the ambiguity of uh, and political debates uh, surrounding the term itself, hate speech has also been discussed as a technological problem. On the one hand, it is a problem because social media platforms and their algorithms uh, help Uh, generate hateful and intolerant communication and its wide reach in society, while on the other, machine learning developers and researchers find it challenging to identify and thus monitor uh, hateful content online. And hate speech detection is part of the ongoing effort against the Uh, oppressive and abusive language on social media using this complex uh, algorithms to flag racist and violent speech faster and better than human beings alone. But machine learning models are prone to learning human-like biases from the training data that feeds um, these algorithms. And it's very easy for the existing bias in our society to be transferred to algorithms. And we see discrimination against race and gender easily perpetrated in machine learning. And algorithm-based differentiations become uh, discriminatory if they lead to unjustified disadvantaging of person, uh, persons with legally uh, protected characteristics in particular age, gender, uh, ethnic origin, re- uh, religion, sexual orientation, sexual identity or disability. And companies like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube hold huge influence over our ability to exercise on our human rights online through the uh, application of content rules, which uh, determine what can and cannot be shared on their platforms. And however, these rules uh, are often vague and broad, and uh, their application is inconsistent and biased. And This means a large amount of content is wrongly removed or wrongly kept online, affecting our right to freedom of expression and ability to be part of public debate and speak out on the issues that matter to us. And too often, these wrongful removals affect those already experiencing discrimination and uh, silencing, including this ethnic minority groups, women, LGBTIQ uh, people, as well as the human rights defenders uh, and journalists. So our goal in this panel is to discuss uh, the distribution of fake news, hate speech, dangerous speech, and discriminated speech on uh, social media platforms uh, and how the big technology uh, companies like Facebook, Twitter, uh, Google are uh, struggling with the spread of hate speech on their platforms, if this effort is enough or not, uh, how are existing algorithms opt to foil discrimination and polarization, and what are the roles uh, of government, uh, civic society, and academics in addressing hate speech on social media? How can free expression be protected while uh, combating hate speech? Now, I am going to give uh, the floor Uh, to Susan Benesh by uh, forwarding my first question. Again, welcome, Professor uh, Benesh. 
so happy uh, to be with you and your contribution is highly appreciated i would like to say this also on behalf of the foundation and uh, uh, susan uh, you know that spread of discriminatory language hate speech and fake news uh, on uh, social media is uh, growing each day every day so what do you think about this uh, situation could you please uh, give us an overview of hate speech uh, on social media what is uh, alarming regarding that and what is getting better do we uh, can we be optimistic or should we be pessimistic on all these thank you First of all, I, I want to very warmly thank the Franting Foundation for inviting me to take part. I am a, a long-standing admirer of the foundation and its work, and the people, including Yasmin, who are associated with it. Um, second, uh, I want to apologize. I have a little, uh, we say frog in my throat, a little cold, so my uh, voice sounds funny, but I am fine. And I don't have COVID, and uh, I, I, I promise I will uh, speak uh, as as uh, nicely as I can. And then third, uh, Yasemin has already uh, given us such an eloquent and um, and thoughtful and comprehensive uh, introduction to the subject that there, in some ways, I think there isn't so much left for me to say. But I will do my best um, regarding the. Uh, the increase in 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 hate speech. Um, uh, first, as 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 Yasemin has so well pointed out, um, it's difficult to get a uh, a clear and um, consensus understanding of what hate speech is. In practice, it's a it's a broad term that covers. Um, we can think about a, a a very large spectrum of human expression from some comments that are insulting, uh, um, diminishing to other humans, um, but not not um, likely to uh, do more than uh, than upset the people they purport to describe and those who sympathize with them. Uh, that spectrum could continue, though, all the way to what I call dangerous speech, which is any kind of human expression that has the capacity to inspire violence against members of another human group. Um, we have all too many examples of that, of uh, as, the, as the social media companies call it, content. That just means some sort of, of human expression of communication. Um, that steadily, um, uh, incrementally changes people's minds and then eventually their behavior so that they commit unspeakable acts. We know that this is the case. And of course, this content circulates much more quickly and more widely online than uh, it did before there, before social media existed. Um, to get a, To answer your question, uh, and to uh, uh, to try to to, to give us a, a, a way to understand and analyze this this rather broad topic, which is hate speech spreading virally uh, around the the, um, uh, the internet and other forms of digital communication like direct messaging apps, which we should surely include as we think about this. Um, it's, it's worth thinking about the different sorts of content. I've already uh, uh, echoed Yasemin in, in pointing out that, that there's really a very wide range of types of hate speech and levels of severity. This is something that the, that the social media companies have only begun to think about. Facebook, for example, um, uh, tested a, a tiers of hate speech, three different tiers that were meant to indicate levels of severity. So that's a, a relatively new idea. They haven't done 
much work on that with algorithms or AI, but it's it's quite interesting. A second way in which it's really worth uh, dividing up hate speech to think about it more more precisely and more usefully is to think about the people who are producing it. And there, are, I'd like to suggest a little a little taxonomy, some categories. First of all, we can think about the people we might call the professionals. Those are people who, for uh, reasons of ideology or very often uh, financial gain, um, but in any case, uh, reasons of self-interest, are producing and very widely disseminating hate speech uh, online. They do it with great um, skill, unfortunately, and with a lot of dedication. Um, they are sometimes working for private actors. They are um, all too often employed by governments. We know of a great many governments around the world that operate what are sometimes informally called troll farms. That is to say, armies, small armies of people who sometimes in turn create what are called bots. A bot from the word robot is a is a little piece of code, of um, software, if you like, uh, that um, impersonates a human, that addresses itself to people online um, as if it were a human. And of course, the advantage of using bots is that you can um, disseminate any kind of content at a gigantic scale, much faster and much more than you can uh, simply using people, even if you have a large number of people. So these uh, troll farms um, and the bots that they uh, deploy have unfortunately an enormous influence. Um, they are uh, usually deployed, they are aimed at specific audiences with specific purposes. For example, to turn one group of people um, uh, violently against another group of people, or um, to convince people that they face an existential threat at the hands of someone else. Um, for example, with a view to getting the audience to vote a particular way in an election. As you surely know, there has been great anxiety in the United States about um, the use of such uh, of such professional operations to disseminate hate speech and also false information um, in order to influence an election. And of course, this is not only the case in the United States. I, I also here would like to point out that um, all too often, there is a significant and powerful overlap between what we call hate speech and what we call disinformation or fake news. Lots and lots of hate speech, as you might imagine, is false. <clears throat> this can itself have a very dangerous consequences. But I promised you more than one category of people who are disseminating hate speech. So first we have the professionals about whom I've already talked a little bit. Then I would say we have the dedicated amateurs. These are people who, for one reason or another, uh, become personally um, fixated on uh, uh, what they perceive as a terrible threat posed by another group of people, or they're fixated on the what they see as um, the evil uh, um, nature of another group of people so that they want to attack them, they want revenge, they want to hurt those people. And those amateurs, um, you know, who are sometimes seen in, in, in my own country using a folkloric archetype we call them the troll in his mother's basement. You know, so this 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 archetype, who unfortunately is real, um, but doesn't capture all of the sorts of people who do this, of course. But the you know the 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 figure we have in our minds is usually a young man um, who hasn't bathed in a while, who is sitting in front of a screen, you know. Uh, maybe 20 hours a day, uh, uh, and and uh, prototypically we say the troll in his mother's basement because for some reason this guy 
is living in in the basement of his mother. Why it's not his father's basement, I can't tell you. Um, and usually in the kind of popular imagination, he's eating some kind of terrible junk food. Uh, in any case, you know, I, 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 I try to, to recount this to you in a humorous way. Mm-hmm. But of course, it's often not funny at all. These people um, uh, uh, go after other groups of people and sometimes also target individuals, for example, women, um, often to terrible effect. And some of them, as we know, uh, also take it upon themselves to um, to take up arms and to commit massacres. For example, unfortunately, my country is is as you know famous for that. Uh, so some of these of these individual trolls um, inspire others to commit terrible acts. And then I would offer you a third category. Uh, and and I sh- and one other thing is that is that those trolls uh, find each other online. And this is one of the enormous um, uh, changes that the internet and particularly social media have brought about, which is that people who never would have found each other in the past can now find each other quite easily, uh, often for wonderful reasons. They want to play chess together, for example, even though they live many, many thousands of kilometers apart. But also people who are very lonely and angry and disaffected um, can find each other very easily. And then um, uh, uh, they they redouble um, and multiply each other's um, each other's anger and each other's uh, dedication to producing hate speech often. Then I want finally to offer you a third category, and those I would call um, to use a very idiomatic English phrase bandwagon jumpers we talk about people who jump on a bandwagon in a parade when uh there's a you know in a traditional parade there's a wagon going along with musicians playing and some people in the crowd get excited and they and they jump on board so online those would be the people who see terrible content circulating and become inspired and and disseminate it themselves or share it themselves even though they are not normally dedicated to this and we see this, um, in fact, in uh, in the results of some very good research that has tried to document the increase in hate speech to which Jessamine referred. <clears throat> in fact, what, what is easier to document uh, than an overall uh, steady increase uh, is sudden spurts, sudden, uh, if you like, geysers of hate speech um, that happen often... Uh, in response to a particular offline event that makes a particular uh, sort of people angry. And then there can be an extremely sudden increase, uh, and then after a while a decrease again until the next spurt. So these are just a few a few notes um, on, uh, on what I see, of course. Um, you know, hate speech is, a, is an ocean, uh, or several oceans, um uh and uh it it also takes many different forms in different um social and political contexts but but i've talked a long time so i'll uh stop and await the next question thank you so much and uh Susa, do you uh, observe a trend a pattern in the uh, sp- spread of hate speech on social media, such as hate speech targets. Uh, you can give uh, examples from United States of America, such as ethnic, uh, religious, uh, national, uh, and sexual uh, identities. Absolutely. Uh, uh, all of the targets you, you mentioned um, are unfortunately subject to torrents of hate speech. Um, I would I would uh, mention at least two specific features of that. One is that often they overlap. So some of the people I I I, I, I described before who are uh, quite dedicated to producing and disseminating hate speech are angry at more than one target group. Uh, in fact, uh, 
Sometimes it's even a bit bewildering. Um, to give you one example, um, the man who committed a massacre in a synagogue in Pittsburgh about two years ago uh, posted just before he did it, um, posts in, in which he was attacking both Muslims and Jews at the same time. Mm-hmm. So I thought, finally, Muslims and Jews are, are united in something. Very tragically, uh, it was, you know, the rage of this, of this guy. Um, uh, women are very often attacked, um, and, uh, 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 as, as I'm sure, you know, also, uh, women journalists, in other words, particular, uh, forms of identity can overlap Mm -hmm. to make a subgroup, especially vulnerable. So women are often attacked and journalists are often attacked. And the people who uh, are producing hate speech um, despise those two particular groups sometimes. And then when there is an overlap in 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 the identity of a person or people such as women journalists, then then that uh, a joint identity makes a person um, even a person or group even more uh, vulnerable. And then the other note I I wanted to um, to offer <clears throat> is that for better and for worse, uh, those, particularly the second category I mentioned, uh, the uh, uh, amateur but very dedicated producers of hate speech are often um, quite ignorant. Mm-hmm. So they they think they're attacking Muslims, but they go after Sikhs, as an example, because Sikhs wear turbans. Mm-hmm. And these people think think that Muslims wear turbans and therefore, you know, you can see. Um, so we, we find sometimes rather peculiar misdirections, actually, of, of hate speech, um, which unfortunately is, is uh, equally damaging sometimes, especially where it inspires um, violence and, and discrimination offline. Yeah, thank you. And let's now talk about a bit uh, social media uh, policies, Susan. Uh, the social media policies against hate speech and uh, other types of discrimination. As we have mentioned, uh, big technology uh, companies such as Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, Google, they have started to uh, develop uh, various uh, policies. You also mentioned what Facebook is doing very recently, to combat uh, the spread of uh, hate speech and fake news on their uh, platforms. Uh, How do you evaluate uh, these efforts? Uh, And what do you think about these policies in uh, preventing the spread of hate speech and harmful speech or dangerous speech online? Yes. Well, I'm smiling because I am a long-standing critic of the companies and of their efforts. <clears throat> However, uh, they have also sometimes invited me and my colleagues to come and 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 offer some ideas and advice. So I have this kind of uh, double role of uh, official grump and critic, you know, and then. Uh, also sometimes arriving grumpily to answer specific questions, you know, because I will say, uh, to be fair, <clears throat> that five, five, seven, eight years ago, uh, the companies were not nearly as interested in doing something about this problem, or I would really call it a set of problems, um, since hate speech is not one thing and 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 it it manifests uh, as i've been suggesting in in lots of different ways but in any case uh the companies were not so interested in this uh just a few years ago and now they are much more interested in it uh and that's for at least two reasons one is um they have been subjected to quite a bit of pressure from outside uh from governments that have passed laws uh, to try to force the companies to do more um, to limit the spread of hate speech 
on the platforms. Um, um, general complaining from uh, uh, people who are um, severely attacked on those platforms. Um, and also people who are interested in it or studying it like me. Um, they, the companies are also at the moment um, fearing that they will be um, uh, forced much, much more vigorously by legislation um, um, and even by supranational efforts like in, in the EU, the European Union. Um, so they are paying, let's say they have been obliged to pay more attention. A second reason, though, which which is only fair to say, is that um, they do have quite a few people on their staffs by now who really do care about this and are trying to do something. I cannot speak that way about the leadership of the companies, in part because I don't hang out with them, you know. Uh, and, um, well... Uh, let's say I, I don't know what the directors of the companies really want, but over the years have become familiar with some of the people who work at the companies. They have also made some effort to hire quite a lot of people who are not American. Um, mm -hmm. So seven or eight years ago, I would have said, this is a small group of young people in California who are trying to make decisions for the whole world. That's terrifying or it should be terrifying. Excuse me. <clears throat> Now they have brought quite a lot of people from other parts of the world to California. And they also um, uh, have offices in many parts of the world. This allows them to, uh, to at least do a somewhat better job of understanding what is going on uh, in other parts of the world, which, by the way, is where the enormous majority of their users are. Uh, I am often uh, frustrated by the fact that even now, much of the policy conversations uh, at the companies focus on the United States and similar countries, even though they know well that 85% at least of their users are outside, um, outside the United States and Europe. So uh, they have made, what I want to say is that they have made in general some progress in specific policies and in generally paying attention to the topic, but there's a lot more uh, a lot more progress to be made. Um, shall I speak a bit specifically about those policies as well? Yes, please do. Okay. First of all, um, let's think a moment about what to do about hate speech. The simplest answer is to delete it. And the enormous majority of the policy conversation has focused on that option for a long time. Um, it is, in my view, um, totally insufficient. Um, it's not possible to take down the content uh, faster than, <clears throat> especially the professionals using bots, can put it back up. So trying to delete all the hate speech is um, sometimes referred to as a game of whack-a-mole. This is a, a game at, at carnivals and festivals um, that you may have seen. It's, uh, there's a big board with a bunch of holes in it, and the, and the person working there gives you a hammer, and little creatures keep popping up out of those holes, and you're supposed to smash them down with a hammer as fast as you can, and if you, if you, I don't know, smash them all successfully, then you win some prize. And of course, the point is you can't win the little, they're supposed to be moles. It's an animal that lives in the ground. You know, the little thingies keep popping up much more quickly than you can smash them down. And that is the case, undoubtedly, with hate speech online. Um, the only way really to solve this problem is to decrease the rate at which that stuff is appearing in the first place. Um, I, uh, have to recognize that there, that there is another tech, potential technological solution, which is to delete the content even before it appears. The companies already have tools for this 
uh, for example, to, uh, to prevent violations of copyright law. If I try to post a photograph or, or some other material for which someone else uh, owns the copyright and uh, the company's algorithm detects that, then it will prevent me from, from posting this material in the first place. They could conceivably do that for hate speech. I think it's an absolutely terrible idea for the reason that Yasmin mentioned, which is that uh, there are huge implications for freedom of expression. Um, with any effort to suppress hate speech, um, if content is deleted even before it appears, it is true that that if if the algorithms select the right content, then harm will be forestalled. No one will get to see that content, and any harm that might have been brought about won't happen. On the other hand, we and this is if 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 you take away one point from everything I say, let it please be this. We have no idea what the algorithms of the companies are and are not identifying as hate speech. They uh, are saying that now um, the vast majority of the content that they identify as hate speech and eventually uh, take down or respond to in some other way uh, is detected automatically, is detected by algorithms. Um, this should make us extremely interested in how those algorithms are functioning and what they are actually detecting, where they are drawing the line between content that is, as the companies put it, actionable. That means they're going to do something about it. And content that is not actionable, that means they will leave it alone. Um, the companies have strongly resisted, of course, sharing information tangible, concrete information about how their algorithms function. Um, first, because those are, you know, that's their professional secret. That's their proprietary information as a business. Um, they, they, of course, also say that a, that a major reason why they don't want to share the information is that if they did that, they feel that then the, the bad people who are disseminating hate speech would be able to do it much more effectively because they would know exactly where the company is drawing the line and they would therefore be able to produce information that is almost crossing the line, but not quite. Um, I'm frankly not convinced by that argument. Uh, if we were to think about law, law draws many lines all the time between behavior that is acceptable uh, and behavior that is unlawful. Laws are of course published so that all of us can know where the lines are drawn. And uh, that does allow for people to uh, act in ways that are nearly unlawful, but not quite. Um, the answer, it seems to me, to that is, if you don't like that, then you should move the line. Then the rule or the law needs to be changed. It is, it is not bad for... Um, for the companies to be transparent about their algorithms. On the contrary, in my view, it's absolutely essential so that um, our freedom of expression, and when I say ours, after all, I'm talking about billions of people for whom social media are now a very important, uh, if not principal means of communication, um, so that our freedom of expression can be protected, not only by the people who work for the companies, even though, as I said, the companies have now hired a larger variety of people, it is still, in my view, crazy and dangerous for them to have exclusive control over what we do get to um, uh, disseminate and what we also get to see and hear. And on the other hand, what we what we don't get to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Uh we were talking about the social media companies. They utilize uh, artificial intelligence uh, to detect and prevent hate speech on their platforms. Uh, what do you think about this new advancement? Don't you have anything positive <laughs> on yes, it? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Just first would of you all, like to review the 
advantages and maybe True. of course disadvantages we know but there absolutely must be advantages of detecting these <clears throat> yeah. unquestionably first of all there are only two ways of attempting to detect hate speech online algorithms or ai in other words software uh 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 as the computer scientists call it, computational means, automatic means. That's one. A machine does it. What's the other one? People. People. So the companies have also, uh, as I said, seven or eight years ago, they weren't so interested in this, in this problem. They didn't work so hard on it, and they didn't have that many people working on it. By now, they have ten, literally tens of thousands of people who are... Uh, underpaid subcontractors um, who sit in front of screens all day long looking at utterly horrifying content. Uh, the companies have um, hired psychologists to try to help these very often young, uh, vulnerable people uh, with the tr tremendous uh, psychological uh, harm that is brought about by, for example, watching beheading videos and uh, other unspeakable content. They are um, being bombarded by terrible content all of the time. They are under enormous pressure to make quick, accurate decisions, whether to leave it up or whether to take it down. It is um, a, a miserable and undoubtedly damaging job. So that's the first reason, it seems to me, to um, to be at, at least very much interested in the possibility of using AI to detect hate speech. And by the way, other forms of harmful content. Uh, the second one is that even though the companies have hired, as I said, literally thousands and thousands of people, um, the scale of all of this is so gigantic that um, you couldn't... You couldn't really hire enough people to do it without at least uh, using algorithms and, uh, and AI for some part of the process. Uh, what many of the companies are doing now, they say, uh, although I, I, I want to note also that we are relying on them uh, for the information that we have about what they are doing. Um, and uh, as the... Um, uh, recent revelations of Francis Haugen, the Facebook uh, whistleblower, reminded us the companies certainly don't always tell the truth about what they're doing. In any case, they claim that uh, for now they are relying on uh, uh, AI or automated means uh, for what they call surfacing um, hate speech, uh, possible hate speech, if you like, that is then supposed to be reviewed by humans who then make, make the final decisions. This uh, apparently uh, saves time uh, for the humans. It, it gives them a kind of, you know, uh, if you can imagine like a, um, an automated filter that then dumps some, some kind of sludge, you know, in the laps of those humans who, uh, who then uh, review it. Um, I, I still am, of course, as a human being, deeply concerned about all of those people whose job it is to look at such awful content and make those awful decisions. Surely for that reason alone, we um, would love all of this to be done uh, by AI, by automated means. Mm -hmm. And uh, detection and uh, prevention studies uh, should be considered in uh, accordance with human rights. It would be crucial to discuss them in relation to ethical concerns. And Susan, in your opinion, uh, what are the ethical concerns in detecting and preventing hate speech? What are the ethical concerns regarding AI and hate speech studies? What are the options uh, <coughs> for regulating AI systems in real world settings, what are the advantages of ex-ante and ex-post monitoring 
I, I mean, I'm just asking you as a whole, just you can. Uh, Absolutely. It's, it's such a vital question. And there are heated <clears throat> debates whether algorithms are biased against specific identities. What do you think about whether the algorithms are biased in terms of different identities, such as ethnic, religious, gender identity, etc.? Thank you. Absolutely. The first thing is, uh, if you ask whether algorithms are biased, Mm -hmm. I will have to ask you, which algorithms? <laughs> you know, each one of them is different. Are they right. are built by different people in somewhat different ways. Uh -huh. uh, what is so striking and to me so worrisome is that <clears throat> I can't answer that question for any algorithm currently in use by any social media company since they they keep them secret. Um There was a, a very interesting experiment a few years ago uh, by uh, Jigsaw, which is the research arm of Google. Mm -hmm. uh, they produced uh, an algorithm um, to uh, try to detect uh, what they described as um, impolite content or content that would make someone want to leave a conversation. Um, they built this uh, uh, this API or algorithm um, by first uh, asking um, humans, uh, known, known by the way informally as mechanical Turks, uh, these are people who are uh, willing to do some work in front of a screen, you know, uh, in exchange, of course, for pay. Uh, they get recruited in large numbers. And in this case, they were asked to look at large uh, amounts of content from the New York Times and from Wikipedia, principally, um, and, and code that content. In other words, say whether, uh, uh, say, of course, in writing, whether this content was something that would make them want to leave the conversation. They were also asked other specific questions. Was it impolite in their view? Um, and on this basis, after, after getting individual people to code hundreds of thousands of individual, you know, bits of content, uh, the Jigsaw team built what they called the perspective API. That's the name they gave it. And they did something extremely unusual, which was to make it, Um, available for outsiders, including researchers, to test it, mm -hmm. to try it out. So, of course, instantly, lots of people like me, uh, you know, got on that and began typing in uh, language to see how it would respond. And one friend of mine typed in the word feminist and got back a response that feminist, the word, was 67% uh, toxic, you know, So as you can imagine, uh, there was a lot of criticism of that perspective API for being totally biased. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, to their credit, the Jigsaw team that had developed this thing uh, worked quite hard to improve it, to remove the bias, which was uh, undoubtedly baked into it or cooked into it by those mechanical Turks, by the people who had done the coding in the first place. That experience uh, uh, strongly suggests that uh, any time an algorithm is built um, based on human decisions regarding a set of training data, as it's called, that algorithm is likely to be biased in one way or another. It would be very difficult to imagine that the humans on whose decisions the algorithm is based have not. Um, inadvertently, you know, um, uh, added some flavors to the soup, so to speak, you know? Yeah. Um, what is absolutely vital, in my view, is to come up with a system, this is something I'm, I'm working on quite actively now, in fact, a system to allow real transparency. Someone must be given access, somebody from outside the companies must be given access 
to study how the algorithms are actually working. Of course, this has to be done under very careful circumstances so that, um, uh, coming back to your question about ethical considerations, yeah. user privacy must be rigorously protected. Um, however, the, the, you know, uh, the greatest ethical concern or uh, human right that, uh, that this effort uh, is vital for protecting is, of course, freedom of expression. Um, we uh, are relying so heavily on the on the social media tools for communication, but we don't even know under what rules our uh, behavior is being regulated. So um, it is uh, an absolutely a critical ethical uh, dilemma how to um, uh, how to protect. Uh, the rights of the people who are uh, circulating content online, and frankly, also to protect uh, the business interests of the companies, um, while very vigorously finally defending the rights of those of us who are using those platforms. Uh, did I understand right? You are working on this recently? Uh, I'm, I'm working on a new related effort uh, with a group of independent researchers. We are mm. academics, we are journalists, we are uh, civil society researchers who have come together uh, to form a coalition to mm. press the companies to share data for serious research um, in a responsible, ethical, privacy-protecting, transparent way this is something that has just emerged in the last uh, three months oh, this is very important well, which is a good work. pressure group yeah which is work. yeah i do <laughs> so let's uh, speak a bit about the roles and the responsibilities of different actors what do you think about the roles and responsibilities such as um, actors such as civil, civil society, governments, academia, uh, internet intermediaries, private companies in combating this dangerous, discriminative discourse, hate speech, blah, blah, blah. And this is another wonderful and critical question. While Until now. Protection, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Protection of freedom of expression, because one hand that, other is that. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. <clears throat> uh, this is another sense in which the discussion just absolutely must be broadened to include some other uh, figures, some other actors. Until now, <clears throat> policy discussions about this have focused, uh, I would say, exclusively or almost exclusively on two kinds of actors, the companies mm -hmm. and governments. And governments uh, generally have tried to uh, um, uh, make constructive progress on this issue by pushing the companies. So it keeps coming back to the same small group of people, relatively small group of people who are decision makers at a relatively small handful of companies. Um, it's important to say also that uh, quite a lot of governments have uh, used the, um, the widespread legitimate concern about hate speech uh, as an excuse to crack down on companies and force them to delete content, uh, for example, by political opponents of those governments. Uh, this is terribly widespread, and it's another enormous threat to freedom of expression. Uh, quite a few countries have passed laws uh, uh, forcing the, the, the companies to take down uh, content uh, that is sympathetic to a group that the government doesn't like, for example. Um, and um, other other uh, government examples of, of content that they demand that the companies take down. In some cases, this is uh, happening on a gigantic scale, and it can be quite difficult for the companies to push back against it. Yeah. Uh, and of course, some governments uh, in, in, in certain circumstances just shut down a whole platform or a whole uh, 
or a whole uh, the internet entirely in, in in some cases. So, unfortunately, governments um, are sometimes legitimately trying to diminish hate speech and sometimes just using it as as an excuse, which is a very important thing to try to guard against. Um, there is another major uh, kind of, of group that has been left out here, and that's um, organizations like the Hunting Foundation that are uh, very uh, knowledgeable, that have done a great deal of work on this topic, um, and that, that have uh, important um, expertise to, to share. But they are very uh, rarely uh, consulted in the policy discussions, at least in a formal way. Uh, in my view, this is absolutely essential and should be done country by country or as the, as the companies uh, would say, market by market, since that's how they, you know, they, they think of it. Um, they cannot really properly understand hate speech in any market uh, unless they are uh, wisely and carefully advised by people and organizations from civil society, academics, journalists who know that context and who understand uh, uh, which content is 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 really uh, bad and which is, let's say, merely insulting or merely uh, distressing to come back to uh, something you said in the beginning, Esme. Um, and then I, I I want to mention civil society in one other respect. Which is that, uh, you know, we, we, we talk quite a bit about what the companies are doing to try to uh, diminish the spread of hate speech on platforms. Um, there are some very interesting initiatives by individuals and even by large groups of people uh, to respond to hate speech online um, that have been largely ignored, as far as I can tell. Um, I'm happy to say that... Uh, um, with my colleagues at the Dangerous Speech Project over the last three years, uh, we have been uh, having a wonderful time uh, studying those people and their initiatives. There is one group of more than 100,000 people who work collectively. And by the way, they are also operating in a dozen different countries. This model has started, it started in Sweden and then it has been replicated uh, from one country to another. Uh, they work collectively to respond to hate speech uh, online. It's totally fascinating. Um, uh, and then we we have collected quite a few other individuals who are now even just beginning to write a book on this because it seems to have been, um, you know, it seems to have kind of slipped under the radar. Of course, those people cannot cure the problem of hate speech on their own, even though there are, you know, many, many thousands of people. This, this problem, as you have said, yes, I mean, uh, is so big that um, that that won't solve it by itself. But surely those kinds of methods should not be ignored, especially since um, they they uh, give an opportunity for two things. One is participation. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of democratic participation. Uh, in great contrast to a to a mysterious automated. Um, uh, you know, top-down a policy, which is which is what algorithmic detection uh, and removal is. Um, and the second reason is is to, just to come back quickly to a point that I made about whack-a-mole, the carnival game, and the fact that ultimately the only solution is to diminish the rate at which this stuff is being posted. That means changing uh, what we academics would call discourse norms. It means convincing people that it is not acceptable to post certain sorts of content. And if that sounds, uh, you know, too idealistic and impossible, I would remind you that within human groups of people, just about any group you can think of that you are part of, there are unspoken, unwritten rules about what you can and cannot say that people obey very, very well for the most part. Um, because one of the characteristics of humans is that almost all of us are very keen to be members of groups, to be accepted by groups and to stay in those groups. And we stay in the groups by following their rules. Um, one of the problems uh, regarding hate speech online, of course, is that there are some groups that are dedicated 
to spreading hate speech. Um, but the more we can uh, reinforce norms against hate speech among the third category of people I mentioned, the people who jump on the wagon, mm -hmm. um, the the less hate speech will dis will um, spread so widely and so uh, so virally. Yeah, thank you. I think this is uh, this were your concluding uh, remarks. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, but now I think our time is up. Uh, but we have half more hour uh, for the question and answers section, and I'm sure we are going to have some questions uh, for such a wonderful talk. Uh, I loved it. <laughs> I'm sure all the participants did. Uh, and we are waiting now from the chat box. We have a question, I think. What is oh, it? Uh, someone has sent me uh, a question uh, as a direct message. That's why you can't see it. And Ali Khan, I see it. I see one from... Please forgive my awful pronunciation. Um, uh, Ogujan Kara. Okay. Says, uh, dear Susan, I have a short question. What is the connection between the system we live in and hate, harmful, dangerous speech? How can we stand against this? Mm -hmm. This is a tremendous question. I, I would just wonder, what do you mean by the system we live in? Could I... Could I ask a question back to the to the questioner? Do you mean a uh, political or social system, or are you talking about social media? Either she can type or maybe open uh, the microphone. Well, I, I, I will I will make a guess in that case. <laughs> um, and and understand the system to refer to social media. Mm -hmm. uh, and since that's the subject of our conversation today, maybe that would also be interesting for other members of the audience. Um, so what's the connection between that system and dangerous speech? I, I want to uh, uh, oh capitalist system, I see. okay, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, well, now I'm, th I'm thinking again, I, I, I I'll answer quickly in both contexts, if I may, um, regarding the capitalist system, uh, the social media companies are making money by capturing people's attention because they sell ads, as you know. That's how they. That's how they make their money. Uh, and unfortunately, hate speech and dangerous speech uh, uh, provoke an emotional reaction, often in people, which can make them stay online and continue to stay on uh, whatever platform it is—Facebook, etc. Um, so, unfortunately. Uh, Hate speech can can be lucrative, can be a money maker. This is a very sad, you know, a sad fact. Um, now you asked, how can one stand against this? Uh, I mentioned already uh, the opportunity to shift discourse norms. You know, if you think about about laws, I often say to my students. Uh, uh, informal law is much more powerful than you might think. After all, there are formal laws against bad behavior like murder and rape, but people still do those things in spite of the law. So we must accept that we'll never be able to completely eliminate uh, hate speech or what I call dangerous speech. And in fact, let's face it, uh, they have been common for all of human history. Uh, Probably most people who have ever lived have, by the way, not been born hating anybody. No baby is ever born hating anybody. But hate speech is useful to malevolent, 
leaders, because it's a good way of getting a group to cohere and to follow a leader. So uh, many people are taught to hate or fear another group of people. I think fear is more important than hatred um, in any case. Uh, however, in the same way that most of us do not, thank goodness, commit murder or rape, we must reinforce norms against this kind of behavior so that the majority of people see it as unacceptable. That's a, a very important contribution. And then I want to say one optimistic thing. Um, as I said, most, most humans have been taught to hate. That's not new. What is really new in my view is that a large number of people, as I, as I, as I mentioned, are actually working systematically against hate speech online. Um, and an even larger number of people think it's bad. That's quite new. Just think about it. Mm -hmm. You know, think about uh, uh, what, what went on uh, in uh, almost all parts of the world only a few centuries ago and for all the centuries before that. Ge massacres and genocides were all too common. Now we have a pretty big consensus against those things. Um, and the more we can organize civil society against them and against hate speech and dangerous speech, the more we will really be doing something new in human history. Then one more optimistic thing, if I may, and then I, I promise I'll, uh, you know, uh, answer the next question. Uh, it's true that dis hate speech disseminates a lot online and that there, you know, there's, there's, there's so much of it, but I, I want to, um, to tell you what I what I think is really much more new and interesting that the internet and digital communications have done. They have made it possible for us to see and listen to the internal communications of other groups of people. Mm -hmm. For example, today I, today and in this time in history, I see what um fervent, ardent supporters of Donald Trump, including the people who thought it was fine to smash their way into the U.S. Capitol on January 6th uh, of this year, I can see them writing and speaking, expressing themselves to each other. It's easy, unfortunately, um, although it's also useful for my work. In other words, I am exposed to what those people have to say to each other. Before the internet, I would never have listened to them. I would never have read what they had to say. I didn't have access to it. So now for good and for bad, many of us are seeing and hearing the internal speech of other human communities. That is very distressing often, but it is also a big opportunity uh, to follow what they're doing. Um, it should, by the way, have allowed U.S. authorities to, to have prevented the attack on the Capitol since the people who planned it were openly uh, spreading their plans online. Uh, so it gives us that opportunity, but it also gives us an opportunity to shift norms against that kind of speech. For example, among young people, mm. it's we have a tremendous opportunity uh, posed by online communication to reach out to uh, people who are not yet fully convinced of terrible ideas and um, offer them alternative views in a way that would have been impossible before uh, digital communications. Thanks. So that's another very important way to, as you said, stand against this. So dear Susan, we have got uh, how many more minutes? left 17 more minutes and we have got two more questions one is from Ali Kanme how can we interfere with hate speech in the print media newspaper, magazine and visual uh, TV etc that's the first question the other one I will tell you later if you want okay. after answering it yes, so where, where that hate speech is um is written by journalists. Uh, surely an important opportunity is, is to reach the journalists. Uh, there are, I know, many uh, media trainings um, around the world that seek to 
um, explain and convince, explain to journalists and convince them um, uh, to be careful about what they uh, what they write so that they can avoid inflaming people while also not suppressing their own, um, you know, their own work in, in ways that uh, might constrain their freedom of expression or that of others. Uh, there are also, um, in quite a few countries, there are uh, uh, um, agreements among media houses, among uh, uh, newspapers, uh, to stick to certain rules of conduct uh, so as to avoid hate speech. Um, of course, where there are uh, owners of newspapers uh, or governments controlling newspapers that want them to spread hate speech, then, you know, that's a, a much more difficult problem. Yeah. Some more questions coming, so we are passing to them. You said that Another question. You said that social media platforms are working on deleting the message of the person who created the hate speech before publishing it. Is it being worked on to develop a counter discourse that will make those who spread that discourse give up? Thank you for this wonderful question. Uh, I said that I have been with my colleagues studying people who respond to hate speech. Um, those, we call them counter speakers. They are people who respond systematically. Um, they have made much more progress than any of the companies have. To my knowledge, the companies have only, uh, I, I know that, for example, Facebook gave some small grants uh, to people who were experimenting with counter speech. Um, one reason, to be fair to the companies, one reason why they don't uh really um do do much to provide an al al alternative or counter uh, discourse is that they see themselves as um providing if you like uh the pipes through which the water will run and the users are the ones who are who are supplying the water maybe one exception to that would be when uh, for example twitter uh, decided to um, to add a little note um, to tweets from um, uh, people I would call you know bad actors or or purveyors of hate speech like Donald Trump. So they would add little little comments. Um, um, they have done this in some cases to correct falsehood, for example. Uh, so we could say that's something like a, a counter, counter discourse or counter narrative as well. Okay. Uh, before uh, passing to the other question, Haluk Cem Demirhan is raising his hand. Uh, yes, please. Mr. Can I open my, my camera if that's okay? <laughs> Um, hi, um, so I'm currently 12th grade and I'm planning to apply to Harvard in uh, regular decisions. And I wanted to ask, what are the opportunities for undergraduate students in detecting hate speech with artificial intelligence? Like, what is Harvard's approach against this? Uh, first of all, that's very exciting. Good luck and let me know if you come. Yeah, sure. Um, it's not possible to say that Harvard has an approach, you know, since it's a large university with many different uh, um, schools within it. You know, there's the, the undergraduate college and then there are <clears throat> many different faculties uh, uh, full of professors who are studying everything from physics to philosophy, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, a few of us who, who, who work there or are associated with different parts of Harvard, you know, um, have our own research on it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I would just tell you that uh, 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 in my view, um, there is nowhere near enough research on how concretely um, to deal with the problem of hate speech. Um, if you're interested in it, I, I, I hope that, that, you know, you will make that the focus of your study. And then um, 
uh, work on that as soon as you can. Thank you so much. And if I if I can be helpful, of course, let me know. I I want to mention one more point very quickly that I that I didn't uh, I didn't succeed in making. I I mentioned that takedown or deleting content is the only one option for responding to hate speech. And I said that the, ultimately the solution is to persuade people not to post it in the first place. There are other options, though. So I'd like to just quickly mention those. One is what is called downranking, especially since this is highly, I want to mention this since it's highly relevant to AI and algorithms. Downranking uh, is, the, is, the, is the term that the companies use for making a piece of content less visible. As you know, the algorithms uh, not the algorithm is simply a word for a piece of software that, that does something. Uh, um, for example, uh, detects particular kinds of content uh, and categorizes it, if you like. So there are some algorithms that that are meant to detect hate speech. There are other algorithms that are designed to feed users content on a particular platform. In the case of Facebook, that's called the news feed algorithm. So that algorithm looks at what I have been looking at on Facebook and then tries to feed me um, content that the algorithm thinks. Of course, it can't really think, but that the that that um, it, it, it's, it is designed to feed me more content that I will want to see and that will keep me on Facebook as long as possible so that I look at lots of ads and make lots of money for Facebook. Um, uh, the newsfeed algorithm is therefore also an absolutely critical newsfeed algorithm at Facebook and the equivalent at other, uh, you know, other platforms, other companies is critical in the dissemination of hate speech since it is feeding you certain content and not other content. Down ranking means making content less likely to appear in news feeds. Um, it, is, it is a very interesting alternative that can be used to suppress content without actually taking it off the platform altogether. However, it raises some, some really important questions like if you down rank content um, so that it will only be seen by people who really, really want it or who are searching for it, will you then create a, a dangerous, you know, silos in which, in which the most toxic and motivated people will share with each other this terrible content while the rest of us are blissfully ignorant that it's there. So uh, uh, downranking is a very interesting policy uh, that also really needs to be understood and studied better. Uh, the, the platforms are experimenting with it a lot, I can tell you, but that's also all in the dark. Okay. So thank you, Haluk. And uh, another question, how can we keep social media platform accountable for fighting hate speech, but prevent that less democratic regimes use the same rhetoric to curtail freedom of speech? At the end, these companies want to keep access to these markets so willing to cooperate with these governments? What a wonderful, uh, important, thoughtful question. Yes, yes it is. Um, well, first of all, um, in some cases, the companies can be helpful against those governments that are using this terrible rhetoric. Um, and in fact, I'm, I'm sure you all have heard that, that one solution that has been proposed to the terribleness of social media is to break up the companies, you know, let the break Facebook into lots of little pieces. Um, one argument against that is that, uh, uh, companies like Facebook have become so powerful that they sometimes can, uh, resist pressure from governments. Um, and in fact, I have tried to encourage them to do that more than they already do. Um, so that's, that's one possibility. 
Um, of course, they also can delete content by uh, political figures that violates their rules. Sometimes they hesitate to do it. Donald Trump is an excellent example. After all, they only finally began to do anything about his content after the storming of the Capitol, at which point, uh, first of all, he had already caused terrible damage, and he was only a few days from the end of his presidency. Um, uh, and second, there was such an enormous consensus in favor of cracking down on him that doing so didn't take any courage at all on the part of the companies. Um, I hope that the experience with Trump has made them a little bit less cowardly. Um, so, so this is this is one uh, you know one option. And since you've asked, how can we keep them accountable? Um, we can pressure them to um, uh, to respond to the accounts of a powerful and influential people in the same way they respond to our accounts. Uh, this is actually a big fight that I'm having with them at the moment. Uh, several of the companies have had exceptions for influential people or for political figures so that they are less strict with those people. And in my view, it should be exactly the opposite. Those people who have tremendous capacity to do harm should be held more strictly accountable than those of us who can't uh, incite a riot. Yeah, I think the last, because the time is nearly up, uh, she wrote in Turkish, shall I, I don't know, uh, pass it to the, it. Uh, or I can do it, um, uh, saying that she's sorry uh, because she participated, uh, she could participate uh, late, and uh, maybe this question was being answered, but I missed it. This no is problem. the question uh, from social media, especially from Twitter, uh, if we want to make a, um, a hate uh, speech analysis, uh, what program uh, for the database uh, base uh, would you suggest? Because it's a very big network and we cannot access to the uh, data uh, easily. So do you recommend, suggest any programs uh, to this uh, person who asked the question. Let, let me just make sure I understand. Is it programs to detect hate speech? Yes. Or to analyze it? Uh, yes, analyze it. Hate speech analysis. One of the problems, uh, in my view, is that, well, first of all, hate speech is extremely context dependent. You know, uh, what is considered hate speech uh, depends enormously on the context in which it is uh, made or disseminated. Um, the platforms, the companies have their own internal uh, algorithms, AI, to, to detect hate speech, but they don't share those. Um, I, I, I suppose the, you know, the most, the most, uh, uh, widely accessible, um, uh, one that I can suggest to you, of course, it unfortunately operates only in English is the perspective API. I'll just put its, its name, uh, here in the chat, uh, that was produced by, uh, Jigsaw. Mm -hmm. which is just the name of the research of the research arm of Google. Um, we just talked about. In yes. And I, and I, and I did discuss that. I don't know if you were already with us at that point. Mm -hmm. um, it, it still, in my view, has quite a lot of, of flaws. And uh, it's another reason why uh, I, I think that not only should the companies be transparent about uh, their own uh, tools for detecting hate speech, but we need um, independent researchers to um, to work together in a variety of languages to um, to build such tools. They are not nearly sufficiently available. 
So thank you. You know, we are so good in time management. It's 2029 in Turkey, just one minute to go. And uh, I think uh, we can end this fantastic, very informative and precious talk of yours today. Thanks so much uh, for your contribution again, Susan. Thank you uh, so much. I have to say that so you are the one. Also. Yes, no, I mean, you no, are the no. one who managed the time beautifully That's and you're a fantastic team, moderator. No. Thank you so much. And hope to see you face to face. Oh, my gosh. Not in this virtual environment, but I must it's say better it, than I, nothing. <laughs> I have a colleague who is going to Istanbul tomorrow. Oh, I'm nice. so tremendously jealous. Please, all of you, just eat one Turkish breakfast for me. Of course, oh. and we will be uh, waiting for you also. <laughs> yeah, I really, uh, what a marvelous place. Uh, hope to and see I, you I, as yes, soon as possible. I hope possible. to see you sometime soon, yes. Thank you so much, Susan. Be well. And thanks to all the rest of the participants. Thank you. Uh, hope to see you as soon as possible. Bye-bye.